Hi there folks, Vince here again with the Tinkerer's Workshop. A couple weeks ago I had the opportunity to travel to Minnesota to tour the Northfield Woodworking Machinery Factory. Now if you're a hobbyist woodworker like myself, you may not be familiar with the name Northfield. It's not as much of a household name as say Delta or Powermatic or even Walker Turner, some of those old brands that have been around for a long time. But Northfield has also been around for quite a while. Uh, they're about 100 years old and they are a manufacturer of high-end industrial quality woodworking equipment, which is probably why uh, they're not quite as well known amongst hobbyist woodworkers. But they are one of the few remaining, if not the only remaining, manufacturer of woodworking equipment that's still making their stuff in the United States. Uh, all the other companies have moved production overseas or shut down production altogether, so most of the stuff now is coming out of China or other parts of Asia and Northfield is a true survivor in that they've kept their doors open and they continue to manufacture uh, high quality woodworking equipment in this country. So I toured their factory and I brought my camcorder along to sh shoot some video footage. Um, it was a very interesting place. They have a lot of old equipment there that's still in use to uh, produce their, their woodworking line and uh, just got some great stories and got to see a lot of neat stuff. So uh, the video quality is not the greatest just because of the lighting situation and the fact that we had a couple dozen people on this tour so there's some background noise. But take a look and I uh, hope you enjoy it. Here we are in front of the Northfield factory. It's not a uh, super imposing building but we'll get inside and take a look around and see what they got to show us. The gentleman in the center of this shot is Jeff Mahachik. He uh, was our tour guide and he's also one of the owners. Uh, he's a fourth generation uh, of the family that has owned Northfield Machinery since it was founded in 1921. Uh, he's currently the owner along with his brother and two cousins. Um, Jeff told us that they have, I, I believe he said, 16 employees and they make between 40 and 60 pieces of equipment per year which may not sound like a lot, but when you see what's involved in making one, one piece of equipment, you'll understand why. Um, in addition to the equipment they make, they also do outside work, so they are able to keep fairly busy. Uh, Jeff said that right now they have a two-year backlog on equipment. So uh, One of the issues that Jeff mentioned they're facing currently is that the foundry that they get their castings from it was a foundry in Wisconsin, and it abruptly shut down. So. They're currently scrambling to gather up all their patterns and to find new uh, new sources for uh, castings. So he said that's been kind of a, a challenge for them right now. As you enter the front door of the factory, you step into a small vestibule area. And to the left are the offices, but if you turn to the right, uh, you'll pass through a door and you're greeted by this large cavernous room which is the main room of the factory. It, it houses a number of pieces of equipment, uh, some of which we'll take a closer look at, but this is just an overview of the main floor. Right at the front of the shop was this Blanchard grinder, which is used for grinding flat surfaces. Uh, you place the piece to be ground on the round turntable looking thing, and then you can see the pink grinding wheel to the right. Uh, Jeff didn't seem to be a big fan of this machine, and you'll hear him talking about this later in the video. This is just one of probably half a dozen different metal lathes that I saw throughout the factory. And if you notice, this lathe has three different chucks stacked up on the spindle, uh, almost like Russian dolls. Jeff explained that it's easier just to leave the large chucks permanently mounted to the lathe, and then remove the smaller chucks when they need to work on larger parts. This is a drilling center. It was made by an Italian manufacturer and basically it's a drill press on steroids. Um, if, if you take a look at the floor to the right of the machine, you'll see some wood planks. And this is actually a cover for a pit that is dug into the floor. So if you need to drill a hole into the end of a long or, or very tall workpiece, you can drop the workpiece into the pit and then swing the head of the machine over to drill the hole. 
Right next to the drilling center was another radial drill press and this one was set up to drill the mounting holes in the trunnions of a batch of table saws that were being made. Here is a pallet full of the trunnions right next to the radial drill. Uh, you'll see these trunnions a little later in the video as well as Jeff explains how they are machined on the metal planer. This is a small metal planer and I say small because on the other side of the room are two even larger planers which you'll see in a little bit. This is a planer mill and unlike a planer that uses a single point cutting tool this machine has a milling head up top that can travel back and forth along the y-axis while the workpiece is mounted to the table below that travels lengthwise along the x-axis. Across from the planer mill were a couple of these large Rockford metal planers. And a planer works similar to a metal shaper in that it uses a single point tool to remove a chip of metal with each stroke. But the difference is that with a planer the tool bit remains stationary and the workpiece travels back and forth on the table. So although he didn't actually make any shavings, uh, just gave us a little demonstration on how the planer is used. Okay, so we're gang cleaning, set the old DD's rock. I get done with this, get the three holes punched in it, and then a pair of them get mounted on a fixture, and this groove gets trepanned into them, and this is the trunnion that allows you to tip your table saw. That's why our saws are so accurate compared to the cheapies. They've got a little pin that everything tips on. We have these huge cradles to hold this. The other thing is, too, have you ever noticed some of the cheapy table saws? They got a big wide slot in the table throat. Mm -hmm. Because they have the center line of this is the tabletop of the machine. So when the blade tips, it stays on the center line of that. Mm -hmm. Same thing goes on a bandsaw. So whenever you re grind and recut a bandsaw table, you've got to re-shim or else the blade's gonna shift lateral. No, the table's gonna shift laterally to make the blade move. 
But that's why this stuff cuts so accurately. I don't sit here for three hours. Okay. No, here on these jobs, I, I've been doing these because this is old school enough where I know how to do it, and there's better, more productive things for the other employees to be doing. So I just peck away at this stuff when I have time. But no, I set the baby monitor up and I just listen to it. That makes sense. Otherwise, that'd be important. And I make sure the stops are double stops or something. You know, I can hear when the tool breaks, and I say, "Oh darn, we'll start over again." But um, yeah, the, normally you can run. If you have a full-time employee here, they can normally be running a couple of these machines at one time. Okay. You know, shortcuts you can't, but you know, some of the table cuts take you know, three hours. Also, too, for putting in dovetail slides, this is still the fastest way we've ever found to put in a dovetail slide than mill milling cutters. You go through so many cutters. Here we just use a form tool, and they come out perfect. They don't work the table. Okay. Within the factory are a number of specialized shop areas, and this is one of those. Uh, this is the grinding shop where workers grind the raw castings as they come in to remove any imperfections, and then they get filled and primed. That's a spray booth to the right there through that doorway. And uh, these are just a few bandsaw castings you see here and all sorts of other castings just sitting here waiting to uh, be moved on to the next step. step. Here's an alcove off the main factory room where castings are stored and aged while they await machining. And these are just some jointer table castings. Just to show you that not everything in the Northfield factory is old school, here are a couple of CNC machining centers. Although it's a bit ironic that they're, they've got this ancient looking buffalo drill press right in between. Um, one of these CNC machines was set up to mill the tops for the table saws. And you can see a stack of tops there that have been milled. Um, these will be taken over to the planer that we saw earlier where the surface will be planed dead flat. This is the metal fabrication shop area. Uh, it's basically used for cutting, bending, or forming sheet metal, tubing, or any other steel stock like you see here. It's a pretty dirty, grungy place, like you'd expect for a metal fab shop. I thought this was kind of funny. Uh, someone must have used this shear to cut a bolt or a rod and put a big nick in the blade. So they painted a subtle reminder on the front. Here's another area at the back of the factory. Once you get past that main room at the front, the factory just keeps on going and going. Um, they've added on to the original building over the years. And in this area, there are several more lathes and uh, a Bridgeport mill. This is the pattern making shop area where they make the wood patterns that are used to create the iron castings at the foundry. So basically, it's a woodworking shop, and as you might expect, all of the machinery is made by Northfield. There's a large table saw, a band saw, a disc sander, a shaper. Um, here is the workbench where they, you can see an example of a pattern right there. It's basically a mold for the sand castings. Uh, on this side was a large pattern maker's jointer, and the Unique thing about this jointer is the front infeed table is hinged so that you can tilt it to put a, a draft angle on the piece you're making. That allows the pattern to release from the mold a little easier. Uh, and there's a large uh, uni unipoint saw. It's a, a radial arm saw, but it's uh, unipoint is Northfield's design. And a large planer. Jeff is talking about the feed mechanism on their planers and why it works better than other designs. And unfortunately, I didn't film the entire discussion, but I wanted to point out the motor and assembly that you see on top of the planer here. This is a grinding attachment that allows you to grind the knives of the planer right on the machine. And these planers are equipped with helical knives, and the grinder can sharpen these in place so you don't have to send them out for sharpening. And while we're on the topic of knives and cutter heads, um, someone asked Jeff about carbide insert heads like the bird. 
And he didn't seem to be a big fan of those. He said they're designed for people who don't know how to change knives. So I, I found that kind of interesting. So Northfield uses ball door motors in all of their equipment. But rather than buying fully assembled motors, they just purchased the individual components, such as rotors and statters from Baldor, and then they assemble the motors in-house. And this allows them to customize the motor shaft length and diameter to suit the particular machine that it will be used with. And they also order the rotors unbalanced and then do their own motor balancing in-house. Uh, Jeff said this gives them better control over the quality of the balancing. Here are some various knife and cutter head guards hung up on the wall just waiting to be paired up with their corresponding machines. I couldn't help shooting some footage of this bin filled with uh, dozens of hand wheels and these are used on various machines whether it be table saws, jointers, planers, band saws but just stacks of them like that I just had to get a shot of it. This is one of the machinery assembly areas, and here are three bandsaws. I, I believe these were 20-inch bandsaws being assembled. And the wheels are in the process of having the rubber tires crowned, and then each wheel is balanced. And the purpose of crowning the tires is to ensure that the blade will track properly on the wheels. So Jeff explained that you don't need much of a crown, and in fact you can barely see it in, the, in this shot here. But in order to crown the wheels, um, they use a grinder that has a very shallow hollow formed in the edge of the grinding wheel. Then they just bring the tire up to the grinding wheel and rotate it to create the crown. Here is a balancing stand where each wheel is balanced individually. This is the crating area where the machines are mounted to wood pallets and then prepared for shipping. Here are a couple of 25 inch planers that are ready to be shipped out. Uh, I believe Jeff said that these were going to a school. Um, he said that they get quite a few orders from schools and government contracts. And one thing you'll notice is how little framing there is around the machines. Uh, Jeff said that if they enclose the machines completely in a crate, the shipping companies have a tendency to stack other things on top of them. So they're actually better off just building a light frame around the pallet. Just as we were getting ready to leave for lunch, this little drill bit storage case caught my eye. Uh, it has a number of swing out trays for various sizes of drill bits. And the whole thing rotates on a Lazy Susan bearing. And in the center is a receptacle for dull drill bits. All right, before I wrap this up, I just wanted to share some uh, brochures from Northfield to give you an idea of the uh, product line that they have. I borrowed these from a friend of mine who was also on the tour, but uh, they've got a pretty good line of, of band saws. Uh, 20 inch, I think, was their smallest. And uh, Jeff mentioned that the band saws were one of their best selling items, but they've got bigger ones 27 and 32 inch saws here. And I think they've got uh, 36 inch is their largest. And they have saws for special purposes uh, or special industries as well. They do a lot of custom things. Shapers. Um, Jeff mentioned that shapers are not a big selling item. They've, it's not as popular as they used to be, but they've got several different models here. Single spindles, and they've got some uh, double spindle ones like this. This is their table saw. It's a, it'll take blades from 14 inches to 18 inches in diameter, so Again, you know, industrial sized equipment. Uh, they had several different sizes of planers. Again, I think 18 inches was the smallest one they had. And then they've got uh, 20, I think 22. Let's see, he's got here. There's a 25 inch, 31 inch. And then I think they even had one. Yeah, 37 inch. I think that was the biggest one I saw in here. Jointers. They have uh, both an 8 and a 12 inch joiner. And then they have their pattern makers jointers. 
which, as I mentioned, the infeed table is hinged at the front so that you can tilt it to create a slight draft angle on pieces. And those they have available in 12, 16, and 24 inch widths. So huge jointers again. Uh, the Unipoint radial saw. This is kind of an interesting radial arm saw. Um, it pivots on a single point so that as you as you pivot it, uh, the blade is always um, pivoting off of one point, which is why it's called the Unipoint. A lot of the other radial arm saws on the market, as you tilt them, the blade kind of shifts to the left or the right. And so this is kind of nice because it stays in one spot. And what else do we have? Uh, there's another cutoff saw. A lot of specialty saws again for for uh, industry cutoff materials and things like that. So that's basically it. I uh, just wanted to let you see what, what kind of equipment they have. So that's Northfield. I uh, had a great time on the tour and I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you.